In a passage in the first part of Beyond Good and Evil, Friedrich Nietzsche discusses the idea of the will, which according to some philosophers, is the best known thing there is. Arthur Schopenhauer in particular claimed that the will was one of the fundamental constituents of the world. Schopenhauer named this the will to life, which can be described as a restless striving all organisms experience to survive and reproduce. We all experience this will as an internal drive to meet our basic biological needs, forged by the power of evolution, which is why Schopenhauer claimed that above all things we experience, the will was the one we could have the most confidence in. Nietzsche, however, regards this as a gross oversimplification of what is actually a rather complicated phenomenon, which enables us to will things which are beyond merely the satisfaction of base biological urges. According to Nietzsche, whenever we will something, several things happen. The first thing we experience are several sensations, including bodily sensations, as if we are moving towards one thing and away from something else. Sensations which put us on the trajectory of the object of our will. Every act of will also involves our conscious thoughts, which have a commanding nature. This is a crucial ingredient in willing, since it organizes the different drives of the psyche and puts them on the path towards a single goal. Thinking alone, however, is not sufficient for us to execute our will, since we may have many thoughts and not be able to put a single one into action. In order for a conscious intention to become a will to action, it requires that the will have an emotional drive strong enough to overcome other psychological drives. The emotional strength of our will must be sufficiently charged so that our entire psyches can be directed towards a singular object. Nietzsche believed that the human psyche was composed of contrary drives which pull in different directions, and so in every act of will, it is as if our higher nature commands our lower nature into action. When we really want something, we have to pull against the forces in our psyche which are less eager, and in doing so, we can fixate upon a particular goal. What is known as freedom of the will is essentially the emotion of supremacy in respect to the one who must obey. I am free, he must obey. This consciousness is inherent in every will, and equally so that tense alertness, a direct gaze concentrated exclusively on one thing alone, the unconditional judgment that this and nothing else is necessary now, an inner certainty that obedience will follow, and whatever else pertains to the condition of giving commands. This is somewhat of a paradox regarding free will, since in order to will anything, it demands that part of ourselves be enslaved. Our lower nature must be enslaved by our higher nature. Freedom necessarily entails enslavement. A person who wills commands something within himself which renders obedience, or which he believes renders obedience. Nietzsche calls these contrary drives which need to be commanded underwills or undersouls, and conceptualizes the psyche as a social system composed of multiple undersouls. Thus, the person doing the willing adds to his pleasurable feeling as commander the pleasurable feelings of the successful executing instruments, underwills or undersouls. Our body is indeed but a social structure composed of many souls. When the higher nature commands obedience from the lower nature, this higher nature can be said to have free will. A concrete example will perhaps make this clearer. One way to get out of a rut is to force yourself to do something difficult, such as going for a run. For people who aren't frequent runners, it can be difficult to get started, since something within you desires instead to be lazy, or even to just give up partway through. In other words, part of you resists your higher conscious intentions. But if your will is strong, you can overcome and override these unconscious drives. Doing anything which is difficult requires exactly that, and being free in your will means overcoming the obstacles which emerge from within your own mind. Nietzsche also makes the following claim regarding the will. Inasmuch as in any given case, we both command and obey, and when we obey, we know the sensations of coercion, impulsion, oppression, resistance, and agitation that begin immediately after the act of will. Inasmuch as, on the other hand, we are in the habit of ignoring or disregarding this duality, and to deceive ourselves about it, by means of a synthetic term I, a whole series of erroneous conclusions, and consequently of false assessments about the will itself, has become attached to the act of willing, to such a degree that he who wills believes firmly that willing is enough for action. These feelings of coercion, impulsion, oppression, resistance, and agitation come from the part of ourselves which resists our higher will, our neurotic thoughts which tell us that we can't do it, or the feelings of anxiety which may thwart us from taking our particular action. According to Nietzsche, all acts of free will 
depend on coercing and commanding these contrary drives. And people often make the error of assuming that the entire psyche is always unified, as though there were only a single I, a single ego, when really there are many competing forces within us. It is when we are able to successfully struggle against our unwilling selves do we attain the ability to seize what we will. Freedom of the will, that is the expression for the complex state of delight of the person exercising volition, who commands and at the same time identifies himself with the executor of the order, who, as such, enjoys also the triumph over obstacles, but thinks within himself that it was really his own will that overcame them. However, this may still be unsatisfactory in regards to the metaphysical question of free will, that is, of whether free will really does exist. In Nietzsche's opinion, free will belongs to the category of concepts which humans have invented for themselves, and is in reality mythological. This at first seems at variance with everything we have just discussed, but surprisingly, Nietzsche also regards the opposite of free will, namely the unfree will, to also be a fictional concept. The unfree will is mythology. In real life, it is only a matter of strong and weak wills. Nietzsche doesn't believe in free will in the typical sense, but he also doesn't believe in its opposite, that of being unfree. We are free within certain confines, but the stronger wills are able to overcome the constraints which arise from within themselves, whereas weaker wills are essentially ruled by these constraints, the so-called undersouls. Nietzsche's ideas about strong wills versus weak wills gives us an idea of how he understood human psychology, and what he believed was necessary in order to accomplish any difficult feat, whether it is writing a book, starting a business, or kicking a drug addiction. The first obstacle is always ourselves, our neurotic states of mind and bad habits. Mastering the psyche means forming a center point to which the rest of the psyche is subordinate, and if our higher nature reigns, then it has successfully imposed its will upon the rest of the psyche. Even if the unconscious tries to thwart us, those with strong wills are able to push themselves against its influence. It is important to keep in mind that Nietzsche never claimed his philosophical standpoint to be truth per se. Instead, he believed that the purpose of philosophy was not truth, but rather utility. The key thing about Nietzsche is that his writings are potentially useful, regardless of whether or not they are true. Nietzsche's goal was to facilitate the growth of free spirits, people who decide their own values, without merely conforming to societal expectations, and his point about free will seems motivated by furthering this goal. In this sense, I agree that Nietzsche's writings can be helpful, especially whenever we want to go beyond our basic instincts and preformed habits, to achieve the truly remarkable.